My name is Barton Morris. This is Christopher Amori. We are our attorneys at the Cannabis Legal Group recording this video from our office here in Royal Oak. Today is August 26, 2021, and we are lawyers from the Cannabis Legal Group. Uh, you can uh, find us at CannabisLegalGroup.com uh, or at our phone number 248-541-2600. Uh, today's video is about the new proposed administrative rules that are uh, out from the Marijuana Regulatory Agency. Uh, as many people in the industry know and recognize that the Marijuana Regulatory Agency has a, uh, a significant uh, comprehensive rule set that is now a permanent one that's in place and that we've been using uh, to administer and govern uh, the commercial facilities that we have here in Michigan. Uh, well, the MRA has put forth a uh, new uh, comprehensive amendment to that rule set uh, and they've and now they're out, they're out their proposed rule sets or so proposed rules. Uh, there are many of them that are that are significantly different, uh, important, comprehensive. Uh, we want to illustrate them. Uh, but first, I wanted to to make sure it's understood. All of the things that we're going to be talking about, they're proposals. They're not they're not permanent. Um, but the, as proposed, they are very important. So they are going to have to go through the administrative rulemaking process. Uh, and quickly, I'll go over basically what that means. Uh, they, they put forth these, uh, these rules to the uh, administrative law department, uh, and then uh, a hearing is scheduled the, to take public comment on them. That hearing uh, for these rules is now scheduled for September 27th, uh, I think, where uh, not only there'll be a public hearing, but they will take public comment. So comment, like we as lawyers will comment, we will send our comments to, um, to them to, to consider uh, the, the rules, and then they will consider amending these rules based, based upon the public comment, uh, and then they will put forth a final uh, rule set uh, after the, um, the Joint Committee on Administrative Rulemaking. They will go over them uh, and take into consideration everything and then uh, put forth those final rules. So if anybody's interested in the rules that we discuss, um, then that might be, it might be a good opportunity for you to, to put forth your, your comments. Or if you're interested in just communicating a, them to us, uh, we can conclude them with our comments as well if we, if we find them to be consistent and we agree with you. Um, uh, I also wanted to note that what we are going to discuss today about six different uh, facets of the rules, uh, they're not all of the rules that are going, that are, going to, that are proposed. Uh, there is like 10 different sections in the administrative rules. Every single one of those sections has proposed changes. Some of them are large, some of them are small, some of them are significant. Other ones are simply just changing MRTMA to capitalize as opposed to in lower case. And so we're not gonna discuss all of them. We're only gonna discuss what we find to be um, some of the most significant changes and the most uh, relevant changes. Uh, but there's gonna be, there's a lot of changes. Um, but I think it's, um, I think it's pretty cool uh, that we go through this process and, and how the rulemaking process does get uh, amended, uh, improved. Uh, we see that like what things that the MRA seems to now find to be an issue that they think that they need to resolve. And so I think that uh, given the fact that we deal with these rules a lot, uh, it's important that we, uh, we talk about them, we recognize them, we have the opportunity to, to shape them, comment on them, and, and help them uh, be uh, formulated into uh, the final rule set because as a final rule, it is basically a law. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, so let's just discuss these uh, and we'll try not to make this too long. I, honestly, we could probably have a, um, a video on each one of these. Um, but I think that uh, first we wanted to discuss uh, employees. Um, Chris, can you comment on that? Sure. So it looks like the MRA in this specific case is looking to provide more of a, an exhaustive list of those people that have been excluded from employment in, in you know, marijuana business. So you know, the rule, kind of to read from the rule, exclusions are based off of a pattern of convictions in, in uh, any jurisdiction involving theft, dishonesty, or fraud, um, conduct involving theft, dishonesty, or fraud that indicates the person will not maintain employment with honesty and integrity. Um, it's important to note that any person that has been excluded in a different jurisdiction outside of Michigan would also be excluded in Michigan. So it's important to kind of factor in that um, ineligibility will be you know, across the United States and it will apply in Michigan as well. 
Uh, it's also important to just that there is a hearing availability that you could appeal this exclusion from um, employment. So the, at least the allowance of, hear, of a hearing and to apply for a hearing within 21 days of receiving notice of exclusion, um, at least the MRA provides this opportunity to kind of fight this um, exclusion and kind of allows you to appeal your opportunity to work in this industry. Right. Uh, so what, I find this really to be an understanding that the MRA really wants to have more oversight on employees. Uh, as of right now, uh, unlike in like Colorado and other states, uh, I know in Colorado, uh, the, they, they require every employee to be registered um, with, with, their, uh, with their agency, with their regulators. Uh, we don't do that, right? Uh, we, we in, our, in our system as of right now, we let our licensees, like the companies, determine whether an, em an employee uh, should or should not be working in a facility or excluded in the facility. What this rule, proposed rule, is, is doing is providing a significant amount of oversight, additional oversight to ensure that they have more control over what employees should be excluded. Um, I think I was telling you about the fact, or perhaps you even uh, identified yourself, they, uh, the, the current rules right now have a uh, provision where the MRA is supposed to keep a list of excluded employees. Uh, and I think that you uh, found out perhaps they don't. There's, there's an exhaustive list that's currently available, but I believe with the MRA, with this specific rule, is kind of putting together that they are going to provide this list. Um, and I'm going to assume they're going to provide it to the marijuana businesses, so that way when they are looking to employ people, there is this list that's going to be available of employees that you know, they are not able to hire. Right. They're, so they're going to create a list. Uh, again, they're supposed to have one now. They don't have one now. We requested one and they don't have it. But there's, obviously they're going to. They find this to be something that is really important that they're going to uh, create a list. I, I think it's interesting. Um, they've identified as ineligible as an employee somebody that had been identified as ineligible in another state. Uh, perhaps that's happening where they're finding people from other states, they're becoming uh, ineligible and then they're coming here and working here because our rules are a little bit more lax about that. Well, evidently, um, that's become an issue. Um, another issue that I, that I found to be interesting is that if a person has engaged in conduct involving theft, dishonesty, or fraud, not necessarily a conviction of it, but simply just conduct. So, for instance, if... Uh, if uh, a bud tender working at a facility um, tried to you know, take some marijuana, or divert some marijuana, uh, that conduct by itself could cause them um, to, be, um, to be excluded. And, and, and that exclusion is permanent unless they ask for a hearing, right? Like I think you mentioned that, because uh, now they're, at, they're providing this opportunity for a hearing. It really does kind of like, make it interesting, or it illustrates the fact that they're really taking away a significant opportunity and right, uh, the opportunity to work in a marijuana facility. And the fact that somebody can be excluded forever, like it's permanent, and, and that really is something that's significant, by, highlighted by the fact that they're giving people the opportunity to have a hearing. So within 21 days, when somebody's been identified as an excluded employee, they have the right to file for a hearing and have an administrative hearing as to whether um, they, they, they should be excluded. So uh, I find that to be uh, super interesting. Anything else? Uh, it, it was interesting that the temporary exclusion is only for those people that have been excluded for conduct, kind of how Barton mentioned, where convictions will likely, based off of this rule, um, lead to the permanent um, exclusions. Yeah. So very interesting. So they're definitely looking to crack down uh, on employees. Mm -hmm. uh, next, I think one of the, the, the most interesting uh, and biggest changes to the rule set is the introduction of a Class A marijuana microbusiness license. Chris, tell us what that is. Sure. So currently a microbusiness license allows for the cultivation of 150 plants. So this Class A marijuana microbusiness license is going to allow for the cultivation of not more than 300 plants. Um, they do differentiate as saying only mature marijuana plants are included in this 300 count. Um, a very important detail that they included this time as well is that the purchase of marijuana concentrate and marijuana infused products from a licensed processor can also be sold to this micro business that can be sold to the, the actual consumer. So previously a micro business would have to have the resources available to process their marijuana into edibles, into gummies, 
And now the MRA has, has put it into a rule that they could actually purchase the, this, you know, these type of infused edibles um, and allow maybe for, for companies without those kind of resources that can kind of be able to get into this type of business. Exactly. Uh, first, I want to make sure that it's clear that this is not a substitute or an amendment of the current micro business license. There still will be that micro business license, although not sure who would do it if you could have a class A micro business license. But then again, maybe that's something up to the municipality. A municipality may choose a micro business license over a class A micro business license. So the, uh, if this rule were to be adopted, and I would imagine that it would in some form or fashion, uh, there will there would exist both types, uh, and I do believe that it will be it, it, it will be it will excuse me be adopted in some form or fashion because there has been a significant complaint about the format or the the rules within uh, that are governing a micro business license. There's been a lot of people that says 150 plants is not enough. It doesn't provide enough product, and the second <clears throat> problem has been the fact that they've had to create their own processed uh, uh, materials, and they'd have to create their own process package materials for sale. Um, this Class A micro business license addresses that where they uh, can now, that license type can now get those products from another processor and then introduce them into their own retail environment and then sell those products to consumers. That really does make uh, this much more viable, right? Like uh, I think that we haven't seen a lot of micro business licenses issued. I mean, as of right now, I think that there's been maybe two. Uh, there's been, as far as by the MRA, I know that there has been some municip have been some municipalities that have authorized them, uh, but they haven't been fully built out. Uh, and I think that there's only been one or two thus far. You know, and after we're talking about a couple of years, um, perhaps this is something that's going to expand mm -hmm. that. Um, that. So that's super interesting. Um, I'd like to perhaps see maybe some additional uh, opportunities for Class A micro business licenses, like for instance, something to encourage municipalities to adopt these more. We just don't see a lot of municipalities providing these opportunities. And one of the reasons why uh, we've provided the Class A opportunities and the micro business opportunities is for small business opportunities, right? Because as we all know and contemplate, a lot of people are thinking that you know, big tobacco, big alcohol, big whomever, big companies are gonna come in and monopolize the entire commercial facilities uh, uh, in Michigan. But if we have more micro businesses, Class A licenses, small mom and pop businesses that, are, that, that, that have opportunities in municipalities where perhaps they don't, they don't let other people in, they're, 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 going to, they're going to protect those opportunities for, for those smaller businesses. And I certainly, well, I'm all for trying to protect small businesses to continue to be able to operate in the market. We like biz, big business too, but we also, we think that both can, can operate within the, within the market here, simply uh, similar to alcohol. There's, of course, you know, Anheuser-Busch, and then there's uh, Bell's Brewery, right? There's, there's an opportunity for both to, to do very well and exist in a market cohesively uh, where, where there's demand for both. Definitely. I mean, speaking of what Barton is saying, there's definitely a large enough market for, you know, I always say a micro-business is kind of like a craft brewery. If you compare that to, you know, Anheuser-Busch, which is going to be these largest grow operations. So right. um, there's definitely a big, a big enough market for both. Yeah. Um, but very cool that, uh, you know, again, this illustrates the fact that uh, the MRA has been given uh, the licensing opportunity or the rulemaking opportunity to create new license types. And while we're on new license types, I guess we might as well talk about another new license type that they want to introduce, which is the educational research license. Um, Chris, you want to talk about it? So uh, speaking of what Barton was saying, the MRA has will begin a marijuana education research license. Uh, it's interesting that it's going to authorize a licensee to obtain marijuana from a marijuana establishment, produce marijuana products, perform research on marijuana and marijuana products, and dispose of marijuana and marijuana products. Uh, it is important to recognize that it says produce marijuana products, not necessarily sell marijuana products to the consumer. Um, also important to distinguish or to, I guess, understand is that a licensee holding a marijuana educational research license shall apply for and obtain necessary, necessary registration uh, with the United States Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, um, within 90 days of actually getting the license. Um, so I guess we'll provide an opportunity 
for maybe some of some of these grow operations or processors to do a little bit of research into maybe specific strains that they want to take a look at, um, you know, specific edibles and gummies and maybe kind of how to improve on their own product. So um, the MRA is at least allowing this type of license for specifically for research, which will only maybe expand the market or at least improve on the products that are already available. This is, um, I think, well needed uh, by the industry. Uh, as Chris mentioned, this doesn't have to be like an independent school trying to, and it could be though, it doesn't have to be like an independent company or school or educational like facility uh, trying to do some research. It could be uh, a grower that's trying to do the research. There's nothing, nothing in here that excludes um, uh, licensees from getting this license, which means that they themselves can perform this educational uh, activity and, and research. Uh, this, uh, you know, listen, I think everybody knows, given the fact that there's been a prohibition of marijuana for the past 50 years, there's been a significant stifling of research related to it. There's so much more that we can learn uh, from this plant, from regard to plant medicine, of course, but with regard to additional products that can be brought to market. I mean, there's the, really, it's, it's endless. We're so early on in this process of, 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 the, of the industry, all over the country, really. Uh, I think this really is another thing that's gonna permit the, the, the expansive educational uh, knowledge that is really necessary for this industry to flourish uh, and, to, and, to, and to mature. Um, again, I think this is another example of the, the state of Michigan and the Department of, uh, well, the Marijuana Regulatory Agency uh, from being a leader, trying to introduce something to, in order to encourage uh, advancement of education and research uh, in the marijuana industry. Um, so obviously, uh, again, another example of the MRA utilizing its authorization to create new license types. Uh, I don't see a lot of people objecting to or, or complaining about this particular one. All right. Next, I think uh, it's really important to discuss uh, the proposed rules as it relates to marijuana infused products, infused, product, infused edibles, and the requirements and restrictions on these infused products. Um, Chris? Yeah, I think one of the most important things to take a look at is the MRA does not want you know, the packaging or you know, the way the food looks to appeal to minors. So um, just to kind of re read through the rules is not to produce an edible marijuana product that is associated with cartoons, caricatures, toys, designs, shapes, labels, um, or packaging, like I said, that appeals to minors. Um, not produce um, products in distinct shapes of humans, animals, or fruits, or shapes that bear the likeness of you know, a cartoon character or a fictional human. And I think the third important part to really realize is um, the package of, of an edible or marijuana product um, should not bear the, the likeness or the, or the image of a commercial, commercially available product. So, like I said, they're trying to stay away from the appeal to minors or, um, you know, a product that may look like that something's already on the market where maybe a child sees something and might take it because they think it's something else or, um, you know, anything that might be dangerous to kind of the users of the product as well. Right. Uh, we again, these rules are generally in response to something that they've identified as a problem. Right. They're making changes because they see it as a problem and they're trying to uh, do something about it. Uh, I, I would imagine that what they've seen are products that have been uh, created uh, that look like other commercially uh, introduced products. Uh, uh, so. Uh, having cookies and brownies is okay, but uh, have a cookie that looks like Chips Ahoy, not okay. Because kids will see that and if it looks like Chips Ahoy, uh, even though it doesn't have any references to you know, children or doesn't have any references to, um, to uh, animals or fruits or shapes or, or likenesses of characters, uh, it is something that's recognizable to children where a child may say, hey, it's Chips Ahoy, let me have that. And of course, we don't want to go there and see what happens thereafter. Uh, and, and absolutely, you know, I don't know parents either. I don't think that a parent wants to look at, I mean, not just parents, but like adults, right? Like uh, the fact that like an adult can look at a package and, can, and confuse it with Chips Ahoy and perhaps ingest a, a marijuana infused product is, is, is also something I think that is a very important distinction and an important rule that needs to be set forth. And so this is uh, definitely addressing that. Uh, I think we support it. 
um, uh, and, and another one of the proposed rules that we think is, uh, is important. Next, uh, I would like to uh, address what I think is uh, one of the most interesting uh, proposed changes is with respect to agreements. Uh, and what I mean by that is agreements, written agreements by licensees agreeing, uh, making a license, uh, excuse me, contractual agreements with other people or another person. They actually identified what another person could be. Um, let me tell you what my, my take is on this. We know that the Marijuana Regulatory Agency in their pre-qualification process requires disclosure from all those individuals that have 10% more, or excuse me, more than 10% equity in a company. This disclosure process has been seen by some to not be uh, uh, good for them. Some people don't want to go through the disclosure process for whatever reason, not necessarily even because of the uh, fear of being denied for a criminal offense or a civil litigation history or something like that. But some people just fear just wanting to, they don't want their name on a license. They think that if their name goes on a license somehow that that's going to make them look bad. That's a whole other video as to whether that's even uh, what, what the reasons are. But the fact is, is that there's many people for what up for all types of different reasons that don't want to disclose. So what do they do? They go to lawyers and they go to lawyers like us and they say, look, what can we do so I can realize my, my business interest and my, and my and financial investment in this marijuana business without having to disclose? And of course, lawyers have gotten more and more sophisticated as it relates to, well, this is what we can do. We can create these sophisticated agreements or contracts in order to be able to permit you to, to realize your business interest, your financial interest in a marijuana business without having to disclose. And those types of business interests could be, for instance, instance, um, a, a contractual interest in the real estate. Somebody could actually own the real estate. And I'm not exactly sure how the marijuana regulatory agency and these proposed rules are going to try to get around it because I, I think that they're probably trying to be a bit too broad as I'm about to explain in a second. But uh, we have clients that simply just want to own the real estate and then want to derive a as they have the right to do, derive a revenue stream from owning the real estate. So for instance, having a marijuana cultivation operation where you know, the, it causes, they you have to do it in a building that, you know, that's in a, in a particular you know, industrial zone, well, an individual could own the building, right? Uh, and then that building, and then they don't have to be on the license, but the licensee pays that person to, um, to own the building. But as the licensee and the building owner want to try to accomplish, they want to accomplish that that payment really takes the form of or is somehow related to, excuse me, related to the um, revenue or the profit of the business, right? Because again, the, their intent is to try to, so it's not an arm's length transaction. It's not just a landlord renting to a, to a, to a, to a, uh, to a uh, leasee. Uh, it's more or a licensee. Uh, it's a landlord trying to actually take part in the business. And this is what they're trying to crack down on because it's not just property, it's licensing agreements or, or um, management agreements or um, intellectual property rights or le the leasing of the, of the uh, equipment. Um, there's a lot of different agreements that lawyers have now become accustomed to and created in order to try to, to, to avert or subvert the rulemaking or the rules that require disclosure. And so uh, they're seeking now to, to disclose all agreements. Um, let's see, do you have that rule? Sure, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it states that all licensing, management, or other agreements must be uh, disclosed to the MRA. So what does other agreements really include? Could include potentially employment agreements, you know, image and likeness agreements, and those type of things. And what they're really trying to get after are those people that are gonna be making 10% or more of the gross or net profits. So ideally, if you're making, if you're, like Barton said, for pre-licensing or pre-qualification, if you own 10% or more, or, sorry, if you own 10, more than 10% of the company, you should be a main applicant. Well, now they're saying if you were gonna be getting more than 10% of the gross net profit, um, you should be an applicant as well. So maybe using someone's kind of, uh, I'm trying to think of maybe using someone's kind of likeness and image, or maybe they have their own pri proprietary way of doing something, their own mixtures, their own strains, uh, but they don't want to be uh, an applicant. Well, if they're going to get 
more than 10% of the gross net profits, um, and now they will be considered an applicant, or at least these agreements will have to be disclosed to the agency. I find that the rules that they've uh, put forth, the, uh, this agreement part in part three of uh, the licensees um, rule set, it really seems to be overbroad, in my opinion. I, 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 I looked in here to try to, to, to distinguish which agreements would uh, satisfy the rule as far as disclosure. What they, what they mean here is they, they not only want to see the agreement, they have to approve it. All agreements uh, with, that, are, that seek to contract with a licensee, management, licensing, or other agreements. Uh, well, where, where do they draw the line here? I don't, and I don't see exactly where they try to do so. Uh, perhaps I, maybe I'm, I'm missing it, but I don't think so. They're looking to get all agreements, and they're looking to oversee and approve all agreements. And they have to; these agreements have to contain certain terms within there in order to preclude other agreements. Like, for instance, the terms that uh, they have to specifically state that there's no other agreement that exists other than this agreement. Um, it, it, I get it. I understand what they're trying to do, and I understand. Listen, we're lawyers, and we've we've drafted some of these agreements that they're referring to. But the agreements that we've done are strictly within the the rules as they exist today. We haven't done anything, and nor there's nobody's ever alleged, of course, that we're doing anything outside of the rules. But now the MRA um, is recognizing that they they they've maybe there's a loophole here, and they're trying to close the loophole. Uh, I don't, I, you know, I don't mind uh, closing of loopholes. I, I do mind when they're really trying to like be overbroad, and, and I know that this is going to be um, something that is uh, going to be objected to. Um, I don't know to what, in what form we're going to uh, propose comments uh, for amendment, but certainly I'm, I'm certain we're going to, to do some. But, uh, but I guess we can learn at least from, from this is, that, is that, that the MRA, they want to know of these other agreements. They want to know who does have these financial arrangements and financial investments in these licensees, who hasn't disclosed, and who does have these managerial um, uh, uh, you know, backdoor type of uh, arrangements. So. Um, but I think the, the last thing we're going to discuss today is the fact that the MRA is seeking to have a bit more requirements over licensees as it relates to their operations. And what I mean by that is that they are requiring that operators, licensees, have uh, two additional things in addition to everything that they also have to have, to have now, which is SOPs, standard operating procedures, and uh, financial records, more detailed the requirement of more detailed financial records. And those financial records actually are probably um, uh, also kind of similar to their intent to find out who is getting the money, mm -hmm. right? Uh, um, SOP, so for instance, right? Standard operating procedures. Now, <clears throat> most of our clients, a lot of marijuana businesses, they have SOPs. And I could tell you that the degree to which that many have them are significantly different. We have SOPs that could be like 10 pages long, and then we have clients that have SOPs, SOPs that are thousands of pages long, and, and pretty much everything in between. And actually, I have, we have some clients that don't have them because they simply are like, we don't need them. The MRA doesn't require them. We think that we're a small enough operation where we don't need them. That's a business decision. Well, evidently, the MRA believes that uh, and I can understand why the MRA believes that all companies, all licensees, should have SOPs. They don't, rec they don't specifically rec say what, to what detail they should have them, but they do um, say that they should have them. Let me tell you an experience of, of mine um, in doing these um, disciplinary hearings um, where a licensee is accused of being in violation of the rules. In every single circumstance, while we're trying to resolve the, uh, these hearings uh, and, the, and the complaints, they always ask, well, what's in your SOPs? Or what are you doing about uh, changing your SOPs in order to address what they believe is to be a, 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 com a complaint or a violation of the rules? Which is, all the, by the way, not always, just because they say there's a violation of the rules doesn't mean it's true. But uh, when there is one, that's, that's one of the things that they seek to uh, to discover what's in your SOPs and what, what are you going to do about your SOPs to ensure that they're being complied with or that, that you have SOPs in the first place. And I think what they've discovered is that there's some companies that simply just don't have SOPs uh, or they don't have them uh, where they are 
uh, significant enough to cover all types of different scenarios. And so now they're introducing the, the requirements of SOPs. Mm -hmm. Any comment about that? Uh, you kind of, as you stated, most companies don't currently have it. So no, most, uh, some companies don't currently have them. Some companies don't currently have them. So really it's EMRA kind of focusing on maybe some of these businesses that one, have them in writing, and two, if there is a violation, they can kind of point to the standard operating procedure and say, what does it say? Well now, um, or how are we going to revise it, or how are you going to improve on something? And now this requirement, well, at least now require our, you know, our companies, our business, marijuana businesses, um, to at least have these oper standard operating procedures in writing, and maybe kind of expand on them, kind of as their operations grow, or as the MR or as the MRA adds other requirements. These other requirements may also need to be included in these standard operating procedures. Yeah, and it says that. Uh, at least the proposed rule says that they must be made available to the agency, the marijuana regulatory agency, uh, upon request, is that they must have up-to-date written operating procedures on-site at all times. Um, and the procedures must comply, of course, with the guidance issued uh, by the agency. I mean, basically saying that if the agency, well, this is interesting, the ag if the agency says something, then your SOPs have to, have to include mm -hmm. it. So, Think about uh, bulletins that they put out, right? Uh, and, 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 and information that they put out. Guidance, it says any guidance issued by the agency. I, I find this to be perhaps an issue uh, because they may put out guidance that doesn't mean that it's a rule, right? Just because they put out guidance, then certainly it has come with a lot of authority. When the MRA, of course, puts guidance out, there's significant authority there. But if it's not codified in a rule, that guidance isn't necessarily a law. Uh, at guidance could be a suggestion. Uh, it could be uh, best practice. Um, it's, this is saying the SOP must comply with any guidance issued by the agency. I think that's, again, a little bit broad. Um, it also says the agency is, well, it makes it seem like the agency will actually be reviewing these SOPs and if there's something that they don't like, it says the licensee may be required to correct and update the standard operating procedures. So it looks like there's a real focus on these SOPs right now. Right. Um, yeah, you know what, and, and I understand that again. Um, but this is why they're proposed. We have the opportunity to, uh, to comment on them. There's going to be public hearings about them, again, September 27th, I believe. Um, we're, going to, we're going to terminate our, our discussion about these, but I, want to, I, mean, I just want to comment on there's, there's, there's many more uh, things in here. Uh, with respect to inter internal analytical testing, where licensees are, you know, want to do their own testing, there's a provision for that. Uh, there's a provision for safety compliance facilities, being able to provide uh, testing to individuals, not just companies and not just licensees, but anybody over the age of 21 can come over, can come and get their product or their marijuana tested. Of course, people growing their own marijuana may want to have it tested, and so they're now giving the opportunity uh, to do that. Um, trade samples to uh, employees is, is an issue. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Uh, there's contact. There, they also include the contact list and limited uh, contact transactions, essentially the curbside transactions, oh, yeah. where you could pay online and you know, roll to a dispensary, grab the product, or have somebody come out and give you the product, and go on your way. So definitely additions that are, I think, are also good for the dispensaries or good for the retailers. Yeah, and that came out because, you know, originally there was no curbside service, right? Like there was no drive-in service. That all came out because of the pandemic, and then they permitted that because the pandemic caused a situation where, of course, they had to provide these services. And now they recognize, I think, that uh, there is a benefit to it, that it is something that's appropriate for the industry. It's not something that, uh, uh, that is to be scared of. Uh, it's actually interesting, you know, how that come about. You know, the pandemic created a situation where now they're adopting a, a final rule set to actually uh, move forward with it, with it. You know, from what I heard, there's a dispensary in Hazel Park that is doing a really sophisticated curbside uh, uh, retail uh, uh, scenario. So, um, you know, good for them, good for the industry, uh, good for the MRA to propose some uh, hopefully really helpful rule sets. Mm -hmm. We will be uh, uh, doing our job as uh, in, in ensuring that we uh, have our voices heard uh, when it comes to uh, passing them, the, the final rule sets. Um, and thank you guys for watching, uh, you know, for the Cannabis Legal Group. My name is Barton Morris. This is Christopher Amore. We can be discovered at CannabisLegalGroup.com. Our office is here at 520 North Main Street in Royal Oak. Uh, thank you very much.